Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Caitlin Yeager, the Director of Heritage Programs for Missouri Humanities. Uh, thank you for joining us today for Chapter 4 of our Explore Missouri's German Heritage Series. It's an eight-part program series that delves into each chapter of the book of the same title by W. Arthur Mayerhoff. Um, Missouri Humanities is a nonprofit organization in the state of Missouri, and our mission is to enrich lives and strengthen communities by connecting people with or connecting Missourians with the people, places, and ideas that shape our society. Um, whether you're joining us through Zoom or watching on Facebook Live, we invite you to interact with us throughout this program. If you're on Facebook, feel free to comment to let us know you're watching or to ask questions for us to consider. If you're on Zoom, feel free to submit questions throughout the program using the chat feature or the Q&A feature, and we'll try and answer as many as possible. Um, as you know, this uh, conversation is based on a book, um, and that book is available for purchase. I'll be posting the link to purchase the book in the chat box on Zoom and also in the comments on the Facebook Live video. They're $25 each, and all proceeds will help us continue to bring free public programs such as these to Missourians. If you enjoy our program today and are interested in seeing more from Missouri Humanities, please check us out on our Facebook page or on our website for the most up-to-date information about our events. We also have a membership program where benefits include free books, discounted tickets to special programs, and access to members-only events. To become a member, visit www.mohumanities.org and click Memberships under the Donate tab. After our program today, I'll be sending everyone an email with a link to our program survey. I would really appreciate it if you could all take some time and let us know what you thought of our presentation. The surveys are really important as we continue to bring public programming to Missourians and work toward a more thoughtful, informed, and civil society. Uh, our conversation today will feature a discussion between myself and Dr. Arthur Mehrhoff, the author of the publication. Um, the central the chapter is uh, shaping the land. Essentially, the sense of place in, within Missouri's German Heritage Corridor and beyond. If you missed any of our last discussions, uh, here's a very brief overview um, of what's been discussed so far. So in chapter one, um, back a couple months ago, it somewhat served as an introduction to Missouri's German heritage and discussed many of the efforts that have been made in recent years to preserve and commemorate that heritage. Our discussion on chapter two, we were joined by Dr. Petra DeWitt in our discussion around cultural identity and conflict for German Americans in Missouri. Last month, our discussion focused on German immigration into Missouri, specifically immigrant groups and German immigrant communities that were established. Dr. Openhorse, a local historian from Warren County, was our special guest. Uh, if you'd like to go back and view the full discussions, the full programs, they are all available under the video tab on our Facebook page. Missouri Humanities Council. So now we're all caught up and we're all ready to go. I'd like to turn this over to Arthur um, and I'm gonna have him help us set the stage for this discussion. So Arthur, uh, why don't you go ahead and um, bring us up to speed here on, on kind of the themes of this chapter and set the stage for us a bit. Bringing us up to speed after three months, four months, I guess, uh, <laughs> uh, that's kind of a contradiction in terms, but uh, um, that's kind of what we're trying to do here. There's a lot of material, as you've probably figured out by now, but this particular chapter, chapter four, um, Shaping the Landscape or Die Landschaften, if, if uh, you know, auf Deutsch, um, <clears throat> I think is, is central to the entire publication. The chapter itself looks at how Missouri Germans use their heritage, if you will, or how they shape the landscape of this, not just the, the German heritage corridor, but really in, in many places throughout Missouri that don't even fit into that uh, um, linear area. But <clears throat> it looks, first of all, at a rural landscape, trying to find a prototype for the theme of sense of place that Caitlin alluded to, which was a major theme um, throughout all our discussions. And the second um, essay looks at um, a prototype, I think, of how urban areas, which many of which had large German um, populations, especially during the 19th century, 
shape their landscapes, but also what happens <laughs> to places where they're affected by all sorts of urban forces and perhaps can they can continue to claim that sense of place. And then finally, the third essay about uh, Dr. George or Georg Engelmann, um, whom most of us probably didn't know that much about, but I hope I corrected that to a certain extent and because his influence extended not just beyond the German heritage corridor, but it um, affected in American life, um, scholarship throughout the world and continues to do so today. So um, looking at how Missouri Germans um, shaped the landscape, the Landschaften is uh, I think um, very important. <clears throat> As Caitlin mentioned, um, this process of trying to um, promote and understand the Missouri's German Heritage Corridor has been going on for some time now. And uh, I believe at least five years, perhaps even more so. And uh, I was involved in the um, steering committee as well as in a symposium, couple symposia that uh, tried to address how do we interpret this heritage? And we worked on a, a, a grant proposal was it four years ago, five years ago? I don't even like that. Yeah, it was a while ago. <laughs> and uh, also in the symposia that um, we tried to look at how to interpret this. And two key themes I think emerged. Um, as, as you've seen in the in the previous episodes of this presentation, the importance of history, historical events, and how that those different periods from the initial emigration, the period around the uh, Missouri Civil War up to the First World War, from First World War really until the 60s or 70s in which that heritage was maybe not seen as something you really want to broadcast. And finally, I think a new emerging appreciation of that heritage and uh, perhaps how it can fit into the many different cultural heritages um, found here in Missouri. So um, this particular chapter, I think reflects that. To me, it's the fulcrum of the publication because um, if you read it, even if you didn't read it, it's, it's still going to show a change in I think style and in approach from history to what some, some anthropologists might call cultural ecology, looking at culture, how people symbolize or um, perhaps the entire way of life of a people and uh, um, looking at all the different related elements from the landscape itself, the natural environment and the built environment to um, <clears throat> all the way down to how people fed themselves and uh, um, beer and wine and uh, all the way down to festivals and museums and even cemeteries at the end. So we're trying to look at a wide array of um, aspects of culture. And I think that uh, you'll see that shift taking place in the publication. So it's a transitional um, period. And I think that Die Landschaften, the, the landscape, how Missouri Germans shaped the landscape uh, was and is foundational to understanding um, this unique cultural ecology. And you, you, you bring up a good point, which is, um, you know, that, that this is something that, that kind of, it's a landmark kind of topic in this book. Um, in talk when we were kind of uh, discussing how to go about, you know, exploring this chapter, we've talked about how uh, this is kind of the middle chapter and it's, it's, a, it's almost a peak and then it, it, we're, we're heading into kind of a different direction with the book. So, so this, this idea of sense of place is really kind of a, a peak or a, or a really big uh, earmarker for this story, for this, this topic of, of German heritage. Um, but a little more broadly, uh, 
why is it that sense of place um, is so frequently brought up when we talk about topics like cultural heritage, historic preservation, and local history? Um, so for those of you that don't know, uh, one of another one of Missouri Humanities public programs are cultural heritage workshops. And for uh, quite a few years now, um, Arthur has been involved in those workshops and giving presentations about place and place making. Um, and it's frequently a presentation that um, not only we bring up in these cultural heritage workshops, but he's had other um, organizations, other communities ask him to come and talk about these topics. So, so people find a lot of value in this idea of sense of place. So, so Arthur, um, and you, you talked a little bit about this already as you did your introduction, but why is it so frequently brought up? Why is it such an important topic when bringing up cultural heritage and history and such when we're talking about these places? When we talk about cultural heritage or historic preservation, um, local history, we're really talking about <laughs> human experiences. We know that <clears throat> if I'm in the desert Southwest, looking maybe at, a, at an old Pueblo or a mission church, that's different than if I'm in um, Minnesota, for example, or in the Pacific Northwest. So we have a just an ex existential sense of, hey, there's something different here. But sense of place, I think, as it's presented here, is really a mental construct or a, a scholarly um, way of trying to make some sense of what it is that's going on when we have those experiences. So, <clears throat> you know, everybody has them, hopefully. <laughs> Otherwise, um, you're really just kind of lost in the world. And one of the, one of the real issues in planning and design, historic preservation, is how to cultivate that um, sense of place, because people seem to like having um, being in places that have um, not just a unique sense of place. There are also landscapes of fear, as cultural geographer Yifu Duan talks about, but that there are ways to go beyond sense of place to incorporate what designers would call pride of place. So I think that's trying to figure out what's unique about a particular place. And uh, um, to the extent that we can, we can, we're taking apart a human experience that comes to us all at once. Okay? But um, we kind of have to do that to get some, some handle on it. The idea of the image of the city really began, I think, in earnest back in the 50s and early 60s. A designer from MIT, um, Dr. Kevin Lynch, wrote a book called The Image of the City. And so for those people in city planning, like myself, um, that really resonated with people. How can we emphasize those unique characteristics? And he broke it down into its different components. But other people said, well, sense of place or image varies from person to person, group to group, um, depends a lot upon you know, whether you're um, a special guest or your maintenance, um, where you are in the pecking order. So it's, it's increasingly been discussed about who wins and who loses um, when we shape the environment like this. And I mentioned in the chapter, Edward Ralph, a Canadian geographer, I believe still living. Um, and he has a wonderful website. So if people are really interested in exploring this more fully, um, Edward Ralph, R-E-L-P-H, um, has one, you know, a lot of blogs, a lot of resources, case studies that people can take a look at. But that's where it ties in to what we're doing here, the humanities, it's the human experience of a geographic area, not just you know, the geographic coordinates or, uh, or the physical characteristics, but really the how people experience it in the real world. And I think that's where sense of place becomes very important. <clears throat> so people have different experiences of the same place, but those areas that seem to have a strong sense of place, we value and we try and hopefully preserve. And in Missouri German heritage, there are 
lots of places like that, whether natural areas or the built environment that seem to make it stand out from other parts of the state. <clears throat> um, Monticello, I had the opportunity to be a research fellow at Monticello about six years ago. And they talked in the Historic Landscape Institute and they're very aware of you know, uh, lots of lots of issues in regarding slavery and uh, uh, issues like that. So they're trying to incorporate more aspects of that environment to show how you know enslaved populations lived as well and their contributions. So in other, in other words, sense of place isn't just one thing, and it's you know. It's open to interpretation, which is why it, it's very important for um, heritage preservation, historic preservation, and cultural heritage tourism. Um, are, are we doing the best we can um, for everyone involved in order to communicate the lessons of that particular place? So as we move through the first essay of this chapter, um, you talk about sense of place in several different categories, more specifically history, landscape, community, and living heritage. So uh, talk a little bit about how these four areas work together to define the presence of German cultural heritage in Missouri. Um, and this next part might be a, a, just a yes or no question, or you can explain more. Does a place need to have all four for a true sense of place? <laughs> Good question. Um, <clears throat> depends on who's defining it, I suppose. We could make, uh, make those four criteria, um, our criteria and say, well, if you don't have it, then it's, it doesn't really have sense of place, but um, that's just my window on the world and others might interpret it differently. So I don't wanna be an absolutist about it, but <laughs> look, those, are, those are some themes that seem to emerge based on the research, based on our discussions in the, about the German Heritage Corridor. And that's one reason why um, I spent time at the beginning of that first essay talking about sense of place and how do we come up with Westphalia out of all of the um, towns or places in the 16 county German Heritage Corridor? Well, you have to plop yourself down someplace. And it seemed as good a prototype, I think, as any, because <clears throat> those different elements um, are all present. And you almost couldn't really separate them in looking at a place like Westphalia. Um, Westphalia, I won't say it's an outlier, but it's unique or unusual in having such a, a tight, um, sense of place, such a uh, you know, tightly knit German, Missouri German community um, compared to others throughout the corridor. Um, not that there aren't you know, similar examples, but that particular landscape, I think, gives very expressive form to its history, to its beliefs about what's important. You know, what do you put on the highest place? Um, just like you know, grandmother has pictures of you and your kids on the mantle. That's pride of place. And I think that uh, we see that in Westphalia as well. What's really important um, is the highest rank has a pride of place, has a very physical expression and it gives expression. It's part of the landscape. I mean, it's, it's hard to say what's what's natural and what's cultural in a place like Westphalia, because it seems to be an entire gestalt, an entire whole, and uh, <clears throat> its history, its traditions, its sense of community all seem to come together in its physical form. So to me, that's why I chose that one. It came highly recommended. And uh, if people saw that old postcard um, that was used as kind of the artifact I worked from. You can still see that landscape today. And I think that's why it's so impressive, I think, 
that sense of place endures over time. And not just that, but as I discovered um, at the Neuner's Winery there, it's very much part of the li ongoing life of that community. It, uh, it, has, it has to do with how people organize themselves, how they relate to one another, both formally and informally. And uh, it's alive, it's alive and well. And I'm not saying this is for everyone. Some people would probably be claustrophobic in a place like that, but uh, I think at its best, a place, a, you know, a town like that, that has a real strong sense of place. Um, I've, se I've seen it enough, like in my work with the Minnesota design team, how communities like that very often in, you know, when there's a tornado or a flood or something like that, how they respond um, almost as, as one organism is, it's, it's awesome to see. So I, I think that's very much the case um, in Missouri as well. So um, can you have a true sense of place without having all of those elements? Um, again, it depends, but um, <clears throat> I actually wrote a, a story for Missouri Life Magazine back in 2006 about the village of Cherry Hill here in Columbia, Missouri, which is a new urbanist development that was, was it used kind of the forms of small town architecture here in Missouri. And, you know, rather than having big streets, it was, it was very much a walkable neighborhood um, with a town square. So it, you know, some people might say it's a stage set, but people I talked to seem to value it because of that, because it was so different from other kinds of development that they see in Columbia and, and elsewhere in Missouri. So I'm not about to say, well, because you're not 100 years old, you don't have a true sense of place. But I, to a certain extent, they kind of borrow that tradition and sense of place from memories that people have of what, you know, um, where there is a strong sense of place. So if you can do it and make it work, I say go for it. And I, I think you bring up a good point there about um, newer places can have sense of place um, and how, you know, just because, you know, just because maybe you don't have, you don't check all four of those boxes right now, you can work toward that. You know, you always have to have had all of those things in the entirety of your community's history in order to have sense of place. You know, places are actively um, incorporating these kinds of themes in order to better the sense of place in their areas. Um, I mean, even into modern day and in building new places, like you said, the, the community in Saint, or in, in Columbia, I think of Newtown St. Charles, um, mm -hmm. has a very similar kind of feel that, that, you know, just because you don't have it now doesn't mean it can't happen. And that, I think that's true of a lot of communities within the German Heritage Corridor. We see, you know, like Westphalia, I think Herman is, is one that, you know, people obviously think of, of of places to where they go there and they feel that German heritage but you know there are dozens and dozens of other communities that are you know we and we've I think we've said this so many times that, that are just as German um, but maybe haven't had the resources or haven't gotten to that point yet where they're able to to capitalize on all of those categories to hit every mark but that doesn't mean they can't that means you know that there are opportunities that are still ahead that you know can make them you know approach the same level as some of those other communities that that have maybe done a little bit more over time to to lock in that heritage instead of you know just you know letting it um so i think there's, that's that's important to 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 make that note there's a saying in community development that it's easy to build a sense of community just live in the same place for three generations <laughs> but maybe in our day and age that's not really possible. Um, maybe we should put a disclaimer at the very beginning of the uh, sessions that, uh, um, you know, every, everybody with a German heritage can, can play and participate here. But, uh, <laughs> um, so you mentioned this, you touched on it when you were doing your intro about, um, 
retaining that German cultural heritage and that sense of place with German cultural heritage uh, in more rural areas versus urban centers in Missouri. And this was a, a very interesting um, theme or concept that you, you talk about both in the book and that we discussed uh, earlier this week when we were setting up for this. Um, so, so a lot, I think a lot of, I mean, just easily looking at a map, Missouri is a rural state. We have a handful of more urban cities, more urban areas, but the majority of the state is rural. So um, most of, or a lot of Missouri's German heritage is found in rural Missouri. Um, but obviously St. Louis is a, a densely German area. Um, places like Jeff City that are considered a little more urban um, is densely German as well. So how can you retain that sense of place as it links to German heritage in an urban center where, you know, so using St. Louis as an example, you know, massive amounts of German immigrants came through St. Louis, settled in St. Louis, but then we had other waves of different group, immigrant groups from different countries over the course of, you know, the several centuries that St. Louis has, has existed. So, you know, over time that, that German heritage, I think, you know, obviously gets diluted, you know, because you have all of these other places, you know, coming in. So how do you maintain that when you're also getting this, this influx of other cultures. And then I think on the flip side of that, you know, comparing that to places in rural Missouri that, you know, bring up the multiple generations thing. I think that's a lot more common in rural areas to stay in the same place for multiple generations. And that culture just continues to get dense and denser and denser because you're, you're staying there and you're building upon it. So, so here, talk a little bit about the difference there and, and how a place like St. Louis differs as far as sense of place in a more rural area. In a nutshell? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> I used to teach courses about this, Caitlin. <laughs> but really, so in a <laughs> yeah. But in a nutshell, I think cities are about change, are about um, you know, dealing or living with strangers and about constant technological innovation. That's part of what makes cities interesting and dynamic. But it also <laughs> means it's pretty hard for an urban ethnic neighborhood to stay an urban ethnic neighborhood over time. And the question is, even should it? But I think um, <clears throat> there, are very, there are strong similarities between strong urban ethnic neighborhoods and small towns. But it's those other factors, those other forces acting upon those urban neighborhoods that I think make it more challenging. So um, to borrow a bit from um, German heritage, there's a classic work in sociology, Gemeinschaft und Gesellschaft by Fernand Tanyas. Um, Gemeinschaft is a close-knit sort of organic communities like Westphalia. Um, Gesellschaft is really um, more like life in the city and based on associations, uh, maybe, you know, affiliations, um, um, but uh, it, you kind of use the city as a tool, but uh, maybe people don't always know you. They may encounter you as a stranger. And that's part of the attraction of city life, but it's also kind of the downside. It can be alienating at times. So um, urban ethnic neighborhoods like old Munich Bird, um, that I talk about in the second essay, um, have to consciously work at fostering a sense of heritage and community um, in ways that small towns, rural areas like West Westphalia don't have to do. It's, I guess it's second nature to the folks in, um, you know, Westphalia. Probably, you know, you may well be related to people through kinship ties, not likely so much in uh, old Munich, but Dr. Walter Schrader, who worked with and was a great help to me on this particular essay, you know, he talked about in his South Side sketches about growing up in um, old Munich Berg and South Side. And you know, it was still a strongly German community back then, but over time it's it's lost that as people can move away or jobs required them to move away, let's say. Um, so what, what they're doing, I think, in Old Munichburg 
is a, a very good example of if you want a sense of heritage, you, know, you have to make it, you have to create it. And um, that to me is part of the excitement of the, the German Heritage Corridor is helping people to one, even realize that there is a German heritage that they can draw upon and two, to bring it to light and to communicate it. And then finally to interpret it. And what, you know, Dr. Schroeder and uh, um, old Munichberg has done so well is communicate that heritage. Um, you know, his blogs, his books, I think have really helped people to, you know, see, see that heritage all around them. And uh, so historical societies, I think, have a real role to play in promoting that heritage. In my, you know, when I worked in community development for the city of St. Louis, there was a big effort to promote and write neighborhood histories so that people had some sense of, wow, this is a unique place. And, uh, to, you know, come to terms with some of the land landmarks, um, the institutions, great open spaces and parks. And so to pull those out somehow, um, whether it's historical research or through festivals, for example, um, I personally believe that the way to cultural diversity um, is through the stomach that uh, people really seem to like getting together with others and sharing unique foods. And so uh, in cities, I think having all these different food fairs, um, ethnic festivals, the way to celebrate, you know, not just German heritage, but you know, whatever the particular mix is in that particular community. And then finally, you can do it through urban design. Um, you can <clears throat> hang banners that, I don't know, maybe you use some um, image from, from that particular heritage, and that becomes a marker, if you will, to set off that neighborhood from, from others. Um, what they've done with the uh, Oktoberfest in, in Old Munichburg, it probably was originally just for that promoting that heritage, but uh, as Oktoberfest tend to do, um, people come from all over um, in order to enjoy them. And uh, it's, it's been a resource, not just for Old Munichburg, but also I think for Jefferson City, I would think that the uh, Chamber of Commerce would, you know, say this is this is important not just for Old Munichburg but also for um, the city as a whole. And what what they've done, uh, in particular, in the uh, uh, the South Side and the business district there, uh, with the murals, for example, um, and also with the that gateway that is depicted in the uh, chapter, which celebrates the, the craftsmanship of you know, the German um, artisans, the, the masons, the iron workers, the uh, stone masons, and gives it very tangible expression. So that it's not, it's an homage to the past, but it's also, I think, um, a reminder that you know, we've got this heritage, let's, let's move forward, you know, it's a gateway as well. So um, you have to think about it and you have to act deliberately in order to um, preserve that heritage. Yeah, and I think um, one, another example, and I just, I just like to bring this up because it's an area I'm familiar with is um, you know, a good example of that, that shift is the, the Bevo Mill and, and Dutchtown areas in, in South St. Louis. Um, I, I live in St. Louis County, but I live in South St. Louis County and I'm a stone's throw away from, from that area. Um, my grandma, who's German, grew up in the area. But, um, you know, as, as you know, time passes and actually, it, you know, as I got into the, the, the early 90s and we received um, a large influx of the Bosnian refugees, that was an area that a lot of them settled into this day. It still has a, a pretty large Bosnian population. And so I think that that was an interesting shift, I think, for people to see it. But as we drive, I drive through there every once in a while, um, you see these glimpses that, you know, it's like, oh yeah, this was a German. <laughs> I remember 
one, for example, was so, I, I looked at it and I said, oh my gosh, it was a, a I think it was a, an automobile auto repair shop. And it was definitely a German name that owned the business. It was a huge part of this corner of this intersection, but it dated back to like the 1890s. And you have to wonder, like in the 1890s, I guarantee you in, in, in Dutchtown, they weren't doing a whole automobile repair. So it makes you wonder, you know, maybe they, they once worked on um, carriages and-, and so Probably a blacksmith and, shop. Yeah, and then shifted with the times and it's been in the same family whole time and I think that's I mean you talk about a sense of place that's a business that has stuck around in this area so you know the second you you think to yourself oh this place isn't really German anymore that kind of smacks you right in the head is oh <laughs> here it is and, and I think that that area too is part of that uh that resurgence of of main or renaming the street names um where they used to be German names and then after World War One and World War Two, they switched them to more you know appropriate Americanized names and, and kind of with this resurgence of interest in German heritage, they've added those original street signs back. Um, so, so you see, you know, I think we went through this period of, of, not, of not seeing that heritage as much, but then, you know, as you learn a little bit more, as you read a little bit more, you drive through that area, you notice it in the architecture, you see it in the business names, and then you see those street signs, that's a more modern attempt to bring back that sense of place. Um, you think, well, you know, a little, little tiny area of St. Louis can, can make little efforts like that. You know, it's, it can't be too hard for a lot of other people to make a little bit of effort too. And, you know, especially in, in more urban centers that have this huge melting pot of all these different heritages. It's like, you don't, you don't want to call anyone in particular out because you don't want to leave others out. But at the same time, you know, you don't want to forget people that help build these areas. It's an, it's an incredible balancing act. Yes. Um, and it really requires openness to one, your sense of your history, if you will, your heritage, but also those of others. And because again, sense of place isn't just one thing and who gets to decide the meaning of symbols, uh, that's a big deal. So we've got a couple of questions that lead perfectly into this next, um, this next discussion topic, which is the, the shaping the land and, and talking more about the natural areas, landscapes, and open spaces. So Steve asks, um, how much stock, just get ready for this question because we know the answer to this. <laughs> how much stock do you put in the idea that some parts of Missouri were settled by Germans because the landscape reminded them of the Missouri River and Rhine River Valleys? And the answer to that is we put a lot of stock in it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's in the historical record. I mean, there are plenty of references. Uh, Duden, Gottfried Duden, you know, talks about that at length. So, uh, but again, it's, it's not unique to Missouri Germans. Uh, cultural geographers will tell you that uh, people tend to migrate to places that remind them of the home country, the old, the old European village as that uh, postcard talked about. Mm -hmm. So, um, and simply because that's what they know and uh but um sometimes what you know can get in the way of what's really there because um the rhineland was famous for riesling wine riesling grapes but missouri missouri's landscape um neither the soil nor the uh um you know the climatology uh, were the same it maybe looked like it but uh, um, so the fact that uh, Terry and Mary Neuner have actually resurrected or um, you know brought back to to life and uh, health Missouri Riesling grapes is an incredible achievement so um, I, I just thought that was incredible but it also illustrates that uh, um, yeah, um, what it looks like isn't necessarily how it functions or feels. <laughs> um, Good question, and, by the way. Yes, and, and here's another one. And, and so I'll, I'll, I'll start by talking about the topic that, that we have at hand, which is um, that we know that sense of place is not just about the built environment, uh, but also the landscape and open spaces. So that leads into to Norman's question, which is, or sorry, Jane, I skipped to Norman. Jane, how important uh, do you think it is 
to a sense of place that the landscape remain or be returned to that I think that's an interesting point returned to what it looked like when our ancestors lived there. I remember hearing of historical sites trying to return the landscape to what during a historical event, like a Civil War battle, for example, or the view George Washington saw from his porch in Mount Vernon. Um, I want to address that a little bit and then I can go into the second part of, um, of my question here. It's an excellent question. Um, by the way, thank you for um, listening, paying attention, and posing thoughtful questions. That um, <clears throat> it's what we call the viewers share in um, art education. That if you know, if we talk but there's nobody out there listening, then I, to a certain extent we don't make a sound. So uh, you complete the circle. You complete the uh, uh, discussion. So how important is the land itself? I would say that it's foundational, quite literally, but also in a very real sense that culture, you know, grows out of the land, and not just the land, but what's beneath the land, the geology, the hydrology, and uh, if, you know, the, the culture that, you know, conquers its natural environment destroys itself, and I think that we have to... Uh, see what the land has to offer, what the natural features have to offer. And those, I think those places that have the strongest sense of place have found ways to do that so that it does not, down, the built and the natural environments seem to fit together. I think of it like a Japanese Zen temple. Um, Franklin Wright, um, who is very influenced by um, Japanese architecture, East, you know, Eastern ways of thinking about nature have said that the land is the most basic form of architecture. And he tried to design in such a way to um, blend into the natural environment. <clears throat> First of all, I think um, there's a tendency to think of open space as just land waiting future development. And I think that's... <laughs> Well, nature has all sorts of contributions to make. And, you know, I think we're becoming more aware of them, um, kind of a race actually to figure out, uh, um, you know, impacts versus what we're doing. But um, whether it's, I don't know, sequestering heart carbon, uh, releasing oxygen, those are good things. We should be very careful about uh, um, stopping that process. Um, the, you know, the natural areas have a way of um, retaining uh, water, moisture, rainfall, snow, you know, snowpack that uh, we haven't quite figured out with our sewer systems and what, what have you, and purification systems, how to do that as well. So um, first thing I would say as a, as a landscape architect would tell me is, uh, what does the land want itself? What does it want to be? What are the natural systems that you need in order to survive? And how do they work together as a system? Up in um, Minneapolis, for example, they've developed um, a park system keyed to the lakes so that it's, it really serves as kind of a one interconnected system. And I think that we, we need to do that as well. I think Missouri Germans had that kind of sensitivity to landscape, not just as a design element where you put your, you know, the peak areas where you put your uh, religious buildings, but uh, there's a romantic attitude toward the land itself. And that romantic attitude also shows up, <laughs> it's transferred, if you will, um, into Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau and Walt Whitman into American transcendentalism. So it's part of our heritage um, as well. In a uh, future chapter, we'll look at the, uh, the house barn and how that was designed with nature, okay? Uh, which way is the wind blowing? <laughs> you know, what, are you, what are you trying to do? And how can you minimize the, the negative environmental impacts without necessarily shouting, you know, here I am. Uh, and I think that uh, the houseborn was, the Pelser houseborn was one way to do that. And quite finally, quite frankly, um, 
kids today, there's a phenomenon called nature deficit disorder. You know, ask kids where certain things come from, carrots or whatever. And usually it's from the grocery store. Uh, there's, mm -hmm. And, you know, ignorance may be bliss, but it, it can also be dangerous. So I think that, uh, you know, we need to think about our relationship to the land more fully. And I think that uh, you know, many of, you know, Missouri Germans brought that heritage with them from people like Goethe and Alexander von Humboldt and, and others. So that's a long way of saying, yes, it's very important. And it should be the foundation for um, our design and planning. And, and Joyce uh, has a comment. It's not a question, it's a comment, but I have a, a slightly personal, not slightly personal, it's a personal anecdote uh, that I'll keep short, but uh, it's very pertinent to this, which, so Joyce says, I lived for three years in Germany and later in a German founded town in Texas. Yes, the landscape has a huge influence on settlement. The areas of Herman, Jefferson City, Columbia are very much like what I remember. And I think the main reason why they settled there. Um, and a, a similar story, Joyce, that's kind of a, a funny anecdote in my family is uh, my parents lived for about that same amount of time in Germany. And uh, as kids have come and gone and gone to school in various colleges in Missouri, taking that Highway 70 path to Mizzou or Truman or what have you, you know, we've spent quite a lot of time in that corridor area. And I had quite the aha moment when I started working for Missouri Humanities and and working on things like German heritage, German cultural heritage, um, when I learned about one of the reasons that you know Germans moved here was because of the land and how similar it was to Germany. And, and I had a huge aha moment because years before this, before I had really any knowledge of, of any of these topics, my parents would call this one stretch of Highway 70 the Germany Hill because as you come up, it's like, a, it's got to be mile markers like one, 169 it's right near that near that high hill uh herman kind of exit mm -hmm. um you come across and all of a sudden there's this vista and I, I i distinctly remember my mom saying wow this looks just like germany and and i was like okay and then for years later that was constantly referred to as the germany hill was used as a point of reference if we were heading back from school and my mom called and would say hey well how far are you from the germany hill <laughs> and and so you know fast forward to you know Two years ago when I started this work, it was kind of like a, oh yeah, <laughs> that makes total sense. You know, it, it does look like Germany and that's what they've been saying for you know, almost 200 years. So it's just a fun little, you know, connection that I, I make to this, this topic because it does um, speak to how important that landscape is. You know, this so much time later, we're still talking about how this area still looks that way. You know, of all the development that area has seen involved with the change, there are still those areas where people look at this and, and see what these immigrants would have seen and, and relate to it. So it's, I think oh, it's incredibly important. If I could go back to Joyce's, I guess it was Joyce or Jane, I can't remember now which, <laughs> um, but uh, talking about trying to envision what it might have looked like, there are now Google map programs that enable you to, if you will, go back through time for a particular set of geographic coordinates and see how development has taken place or if you will, reverse it and see what it used to look like. And that cost, you know, this is about humanities. Um, there's a famous line from uh, the great Gatsby where Nick Carraway at the end is you know, looking at the disaster that is Gatsby's, you know, former place. And he talks about the inessential houses melt away. And he sees, you know, the original new world vision that attracted those settlers. And if we could do that, if we could, you know, not to live in the past, but to have the past live in us, I think that's um, maybe the key. And negotiating the past, the present, and the future so that our heritage has a voice in this discussion as well. Um, so Sherry asks about any Missouri cities that have German social, wait, any Missouri cities that have German social culture groups. Um, there are several that I know of. Um, Sherry, I know that I'm not sure where you are in Missouri or outside Missouri even. Um, 
St. Louis, there's the German Cultural Society. It's very active. Uh, I know that there are several sister city, German sister city organizations that are very active. Um, I know that there's uh, St. Louis Shipyard, there's Kansas City Hanover, um, Washington has one, Herman, New Haven. There's lots of examples of German sister city organizations that do um, not just German themed events, and, and but they also do partnership activities with their sister cities. Um, those, are, those are some of the big ones. I think Old Munichburg Association is a, is a group in, in, in Jeff City that I think they're the ones that kind of spearhead a lot of the efforts uh, with Oktoberfest there. Um, so there's lots of examples, I think, of, of groups if people are interested in getting involved in doing more modern things with German cultural heritage, because there's a lot out there. Um, those are just a handful that I know off the top of my head. Arthur, if you've got other well, I, was, I was going to say that uh, Deutschheim State Historic Site in Hermann <clears throat> is not just about Hermann. It's a state historic site. And so they can serve as a um, honest information broker about uh, a lot of these groups and, and put people in touch with um, you know, areas or organizations that have related themes or objectives. So I won't say it's one-stop shopping, but it, it certainly is a good one that's established by the state of Missouri for exactly that purpose of promoting Missouri's German heritage. Well, and you mentioned Deutschheim State Historic Site. That naturally leads me to the Deutschheim Verein. Um, so a Verein historically was a social club. Um, and so a couple of those that I know of still exist. There's the Augusta Harmony Verein in Augusta, Missouri. They're a little smaller, and I think they're, they're doing more renewed efforts to, to have more activity in the Augusta area. But there's I know there's kind of a, a newer board or new group that are trying to, to not only restore the original Harmony Brian building, but increase activity um, in the Augusta area. Um, and then there's the Deutschheim Brian, like I said, which is a, a very active um, group. Uh, I, know, I know Petra DeWitt is watching and I'm pretty sure she's a very active member of the Deutschheim Brian. Um, and, and that's, uh, the, those are several. Um, so just to, just to, to the many, many options. <laughs> and uh, we should also mention, even though it's not necessarily in the um, German Heritage Corridor geographic area that uh, you're on Perryville, um, there's very, very strong uh, German associations with real strength in uh, especially uh, Missouri German Lutheran um, emigration as well. Um, more questions. I think I'll, I'll prioritize other people's questions over mine. Um, so someone asked, this is kind of an interesting question. Um, so I, I'm interested to see your, your comment on this. Norman asked that in looking back over family photos and letters, I find few non-member, non-family members in photos. Does that mean that family was simply more important until after World War II and therefore was a strong force in shaping German heritage? Connection, interesting hypothesis. I, I think that's um, a fantastic piece of historical analysis. <clears throat> I mean, you'd obviously need more data, but that's what um, the use of photogra photographs and artifacts like that can suggest. So it it has to be balanced with you know other kinds of research, but as a source of historical hypotheses or theses, if you will. Um, that's, a, that's a great one. I mean, it's, you know, that Gemeinschaft to Gesellschaft from uh, close-knit community friendship ties to, you know, you know, probably you'd have a picture of yourself in a restaurant or, you know, doing something. But, uh, no, I think that's a, it's a keen observation, first of all, and I think it's a very suggestive hypothesis, too. Mm -hmm. well, Arthur, I'm kind of wrapping up here. Um, any other topics or any other uh, things you want to touch back on? Or if anybody has uh, some last minute questions to, to submit, we've got a couple minutes before uh, our official end of the program. Um, and I think if, I, if I, I've got one or two questions left, but I think they would warrant a longer discussion than three minutes. So 
But any <laughs> other uh, comments from you, Arthur, or from our uh, attendees, feel free to submit, but I'll, I'll kind of have you wrap up a little bit before I do. If you haven't read the essay about a uh, picture worth a thousand words regarding Dr. George Georg Engelman, I encourage you to do so. Um, he's become one of my culture heroes and should be, I think, on just about anyone's list, German or not. Um, I mean, <clears throat> his connection to Goethe himself, this you know, great enlightenment uh, transitional figure. Um, you know, if, if Goethe says, I'd like to read your work, that to me says, you know, this, this is someone you need to pay attention to, first of all. Um, but uh, uh, what, you know, what he was able to do, his, his approach, if you will, of um, exploration like von Humboldt and uh, very detailed and artistic, um, you know, descriptions. And he also created these incredibly rich research networks throughout the United States. People came to him to learn about the, uh, you know, the desert Southwest, the cacti, and, uh, and also he just, you know, discovered or at least uh, helped to categorize things like the, uh, you know, the Engelman spruce. And uh, his work is still cited um, by researchers. You know, to Henry Shaw was made a legacy and we're very grateful for that. But I think without the efforts of Dr. Engelman, Missouri Botanical Garden wouldn't be the botanical garden that it is today. You can, you can see in Tower Grove Park, this wonderful pleasure garden, this you know, kind of late Victor Victorian pleasure garden, but Missouri Botanical Garden is an incredible research um, network that's um, helping preserve natural um, species throughout the world, especially in the rainforest. And it's his ongoing legacy of, of research. Um, you know, the National Academy of Science included him as one of its charter members. That's a big deal. Um, you know, the uh, Science Center here in St. In St. Louis, I think, is, uh, um, is also a big deal. It's something we still um, enjoy and, and are educated by. And uh, so there, you know, it's, it's all around us, um, his influence. And uh, for that, I am very grateful. I'm just grateful for the opportunity to, to focus on this particular one. So uh, um, sense of place can be small, it can be a neighborhood, or you, it can be something that helps connect us to the natural world, what um, Nobel prize winner E.O. Wilson calls biophilia. And I think that Dr. Engelman helped promote that and maybe we need a bigger dose of his medicine. Well, Arthur, thank you so much once again for a lovely discussion. It's always a pleasure. Um, a few uh, housekeeping things just to remind you all. Um, I will be sending out that survey link in just a little bit here. Please uh, take some time to fill it out there. Not too much of a pain there. I try and keep them fairly uh, to the point, uh, just keeping the important stuff that I like to know. Um, if you guys are interested in seeing more from us, I highly recommend becoming a member. Um, there's various membership levels for all different kinds of households um, and lots of fun um, hopefully once um, the world opens back up and we're able to have fun in-person events again, uh, perks include uh, exclusive uh, events such as those, uh, cocktail hours, meetings with um, keynote speakers and authors, you know, talkbacks, lots of fun stuff. So um, anyone interested in becoming a member of Missouri Communities can visit mohumanities.org and go to the Donate tab and click Membership. Super easy, uh, super great, um, lots of free stuff with membership. So um, survey memberships. Uh, feel free to follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, um, at Mo Humanities. That's our, our tag. Um, and aside from that, I, I thank you all for your time uh, on this Thursday morning. I hope the weather is as nice where all you are as it is here today in St. Louis. Um, have a wonderful holiday season uh, since we won't see you guys until, until January. Our next program is January 14th at 10 a.m. That'll be chapter five. Happy holidays to all of you and your loved ones. I hope you all stay safe and healthy. 
um, happy new year and we will see you guys all in January. Thank you again, Arthur. Frühlicke Weihnachten. <laughs> what he said. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>